Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. In today's lecture of ECE 3084 Signals and Systems, I would like to explore ways to represent electrical circuits in the Laplace transform domain. This is often more convenient than dealing with differential equations directly in the time domain. But crucially, these techniques rely on the linearity of the Laplace transform, and hence we'll restrict our domain of discourse to linear elements like resistors, capacitors, and inductors. Here I've written down the standard time domain relations for resistors, capacitors, and inductors. The relationship between voltage and current for the resistor is just multiplication by a constant given by Ohm's law. The current through a capacitor is the capacitance times the derivative of the current. And for the inductor, which is something of a dual of the capacitor, the voltage is equal to the inductance times the derivative of the current. Here we're using our standard passive component convention, where we're drawing a current arrow that's going from the positive point to the negative point in terms of how we're measuring the voltage. Now, technically speaking, if our current is positive, that means that the electrons are actually flowing the opposite direction of the drawn arrow, but we generally don't talk about that. Now, I have some differential equations here. These are linear differential equations. Well, the thing over here isn't even really a differential equation. It's just, it's just something times a constant. That's what Ohm's law says. So I can very much take the Laplace transform of both sides of all of these equations. So on the left, I'll write capital sub R of S is equal to R times the current in the Laplace domain. And what we're going to do is define this R here as Z sub R, which is the impedance of a resistor. Or I should say we're defining Z sub R as R. All right, so let's take a look at what happens if we do a similar Laplaceification for the capacitor. I'll have the capacitance in the Laplace transform domain on the left. C, well, we're taking the derivative of a function. So we know that in the Laplace domain, that would correspond to taking its Laplace transform, capital sub C S, times an S variable, but I also need to subtract a pre-initial condition. So I'll write VC in the time domain, but evaluated at zero with this little minus to indicate that we're really sort of focusing on what is it infinitesimally before T equals zero. Now, most circuits textbooks, or for that matter, most differential equations textbooks, won't make a big deal about this superscript minus, but I find it useful to do so, at least definitely in the context of a class like 3084. All right, so for the inductor, I'll write V sub C S is equal to L times, and now we'll have a similar structure. I'm going to take the Laplace domain representation of the current, multiply it by S, and subtract whatever the current is at this little zero minus, this pre-initial condition. So capacitors store energy in an electrical field, and inductors store energy in a magnetic field. And these quantities here represent the voltage or the current that was already present in the capacitor or the inductor whenever our analysis begins at t equals zero. Now for the capacitor expression, let me take the C and just multiply it through. And similarly here for the inductor, I'll write L S I L S minus L I L pre-initial condition. I'm going a little overboard with the color usage here. All right, so let me define an impedance of the capacitor, Z sub C, as one over C S and I'll show you why I'm doing this in a second. I'm going to define an impedance of the inductor as L times the Laplace variable S. Let me emphasize that is a definition. And I guess to be pedantic, I should write this as a separate line. So I'll write ZR equal R. That's not terribly interesting. In terms of impedance, the inductor and the capacitor are more interesting. Anyway, I can rewrite these expressions using the impedances I've defined. Wow, it is really not clear that this is an L, is it? Let me fix those. So L, L. Those L's were looking far too much like C's. 
All right. So down here, I'll have VL is equal to Z sub L, which is my impedance, times ILS minus L times my initial condition. Kind of running out of space on the right here. I didn't plan this well. So I'm going to write ICS is equal to VCS over ZC. And I have to put the impedance down here in order to flip over the 1 over CS to get the CS up here, minus C times my initial condition, my pre-initial condition, I should say, on the voltage, if I want to be particularly picky about it. All right, so my goal is to take these circuits in the time domain and write down equivalent circuit models in the Laplace domain. Now, this is going to be pretty easy to do for the resistor. All I really need to do is take the R here and replace it with ZR, and then replace the current in the time domain with the current in the Laplace domain, and replace the voltage in the time domain with the voltage in the Laplace domain. So I haven't really changed the schematic here. Nothing very interesting happened there. Now, for the capacitor, it's going to be a little bit different. All right, so I have an expression that's a sum of a couple of things. Well, one of the terms has a minus sign on it, so it's a difference of a couple of things. But what am I actually, quote unquote, summing up here? Well, I'm summing currents. And if we think about the circuit rules involving currents, current sources in parallel sum. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to replace the capacitor with two terms. One of them is going to be an impedance of ZC, and the other is going to be a current source of value C, VC, zero with the little minus. So this is the capacitance times the voltage stored at the capacitor when our dynamic system starts at t equals zero. Because I have a minus here, I need the arrow of this current source to be going the opposite direction. So it's going to look a little something like this. Now, people will often, instead of writing this generic impedance block here, they'll go ahead and they'll write a capacitor symbol, and they'll write the impedance next to it, which is 1 over Cs. One thing I might do here to be very clear about this is let me rewrite this as 1 over Cs to indicate what the impedance is. All right, so that's our Laplace domain model for a capacitor that includes an initial condition. What about the inductor? Well, here I have a sum of a couple terms, and of course one of those terms has a minus, so it's really a difference, but generically we can think of it as a sum of terms. And what are we summing? Well, we're summing voltages. And if we think about the circuit rules associated with voltages, voltage sources in series add. So although we had a parallel model for the capacitor, given that the inductor is sort of a dual to the capacitor, it will not surprise us to note that what we'll write down here is now a series model for the inductor. So I'm going to write an impedance of ZL in a little generic impedance block. Let me explicitly write that here as LS. And it's going to be in series with a voltage source where the voltage is L times the pre-initial condition on the current. And I have to be careful with the minus sign. Remember, we're generally measuring voltages plus to minus going this direction, corresponding to our passive current convention here. Oh, very important thing I forgot to do. Over here, this really needs to be in the Laplace domain now. So the current here is capital I, CS, and the current here is capital I, L, S. Because of the direction this current arrow is going and we we're measuring voltages going plus to minus, because we have a minus sign here, I need to flip the order of the minus and plus on our voltage source. So I'm actually going to put a minus up here 
and then the plus down here like this to accommodate that minus sign. So this is now a Laplace domain equivalent circuit model for an inductor, including the case where you may have some energy stored in the magnetic field of the inductor ahead of time. Just as over here, this can accommodate having some energy stored in the electric field of the capacitor ahead of time. So impedance is an extension of the idea of resistance. Why the word impedance? I guess they grabbed a thesaurus and looked up resist. And among the things they found, they found impede. I guess they could have called it stubbornness um, or, I don't know, <laughs> nopitude. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, I'm going to need some more space, so I'm going to scooch around our impedance definitions. Scoosh. I should mention that just as with the capacitor, if you have a purely capacitive impedance, you will often just write a capacitor symbol instead of this generic impedance block. Similarly, here I wrote a generic impedance block, but if it is a purely inductive impedance, often you will write a inductor symbol and write LS next to it. It's a matter of personal preference, what kind of schematic notation you use for impedances. And in any case, once you get to more complicated impedances, you just wind up writing blocks down anyway. All right, let me play some games here. Let me take these expressions and move this bit with the negative in front over to the other side. So I'll write ICS plus CVC evaluated at this pre-initial spot, this zero, little zero minus, and I'll write CSV. CS. And over here, I'll write VLS plus L pre-initial condition on the current equals LS, capital ILS. All right, so just as earlier, I wrote an expression in terms of a sum of currents for the capacitor and in terms of a sum of voltages for the inductor. We'll play the same kind of game except for the alternate circuit variable. All right, so making more space, I'm also going to flip the order of the expression and just write this as VCS over here equals ICS. But now I'll need to divide everything by CS to get rid of the CS here. So I'll have a divide by CS here, and then I'll have plus my pre initial condition on the voltage divided by just S, because when I divide by CS, I'll wind up with an S down here. But when I divide by C, then these Cs will cancel in that term. All right, so let's play the same kind of game over here. But now I'll have ILS over here, and then on the right, I'll have VLS divided by LS, since I need to divide the whole expression through by LS in order to get this LS here to cancel. And then I'll wind up with my pre-initial condition on the current divided by S, but in a similar way that the C wound up disappearing in this kind of term. When I divide by LS, I get the S in the denominator, but Ls wind up canceling. So I wind up with just an S down here without the L. And I'm going to need a bit more space, so let's get rid of this. And let's get rid of this. Let me squoosh this up. I have an inexplicable urge to make this L yellow to match the other Ls. Anyway, all right, so this voltage is equal to Zc times the current in the Laplace domain for the capacitor using this definition of the impedance of the capacitor plus the pre initial voltage over S. And over here with the inductor, I'll have the voltage over the impedance of the inductor according to this definition here. So I have plus the pre-initial current divided by S. All right, so since the resistor is not very interesting, I'm going to get rid of it in the interest of making some space. Let me move these down. So this fabulous expression here gives us a new Laplace equivalent circuit for the capacitor. 
Here it's now given in terms of a voltage, and here I'm just adding a couple of voltages without worrying about any minus signs, and we know that voltages in parallel add. So I'll express this new circuit as a impedance 1 over Cs by our definition. And again, you could write it with a capacitor symbol there if you wanted. And then I'll have a voltage source in series with it, except this time I don't need to swap the plus and the minus the way I had to do with the inductor because there was a minus sign in the case of the inductor. And what is the voltage here? So I have Vc, that pre-initial condition, divided by S. Remember, this is all in the Laplace domain, so things are a little weird. And my current arrow is still pointing downwards. All right, so now this expression here in the lower right, this gives us a new Laplace domain equivalent circuit for the inductor. This is now in terms of currents, so I'm summing a couple of currents, again, now without any minus signs. So what I'll do here is I'll put an impedance LS, the impedance of our inductor, and I'll put that in parallel with a current source. And now that current source is going the same direction as our overall current definition in here, because unlike the case in the parallel model for the capacitor, where we had to flip the order because of a minus sign, there's no minus sign here. And what do I write next to this current source? IL zero minus my pre-initial condition on the current divided by S. Now, ideally, I should take this here and kind of move it <laughs> in this spot. And I should take this here and move it in this spot to put everything in an appropriate spot. But I don't want to get rid of the stuff here in the middle yet because there's another point I want to make. So if you are not one of my ECE 3084 students at Georgia Tech, just hang out for 30 seconds. I'll continue the main lecture in a second. If you are one of my students, go to Canvas and you will find a quiz titled something like Lecture 53 Quiz. And there will be four questions. The first question, I want you to tell me what your favorite class is that's not 3084 and not some other class that you might have had me with as a professor. And the second question is, what was your favorite thing about that favorite class? I'll tell you about questions three and four later. And let's go back to the time domain for a second. Let me take both sides of these expressions and integrate them. Let's tweak this a bit by dividing both sides of the expression for the inductor by L, and we'll similarly divide both sides of the expression for the capacitor by C. And now to avoid some confusion involving time variables, let me replace the T's in here with some tau's. So it's representing the same sort of mathematical thing but I'm going to want to introduce some new t's. So let's make this tau, tau, you get a tau, and you get a tau. All right, need a tau there too. All right, tau's for everybody. Okay, and let me grab this and kind of scoosh it. So what I wanna do now is integrate both of these sides from zero with this little superscript minus up to t. So I'll put a d tau here. So obviously I have to do the same thing on the other side. Let me move that over a bit. So I can put d tau here. This is starting to get a bit crowded. So let me grab this and once again engage in some squishification. So we'll have to move the equal sign over here. And I have d tau, d tau. Oh, this integral's crowded. <laughs> zero minus to t, zero minus to t. All right, that's kind of ugly. Let me put a big squiggly line here to try to indicate that this is not multiplied by that because they're all squished up together like that. All right, so let's do some integration. Here I have one over c that can pull out in front of the integral. I'm going to integrate from zero to t with this Interesting little superscript minus, I see tau, 
Detail. And this is just an integral. I don't know anything else about it. I'm just going to leave it in that form. Now, I'm integrating a derivative. So I can pull out our fundamental theorem of calculus. One operation undoes the other. So by my fundamental theorem of calculus, I can take this VC tau and plug in the upper limit for tau, which is t. And then I can plug in the lower limit, which is the zero superscript minus for t. Similarly, on the right here, my 1 over L pulls out in front. I'll represent the integral of the voltage here as just the integral of the voltage. Don't really know anything else about that. And again, here I'm integrating a derivative, so I can use the fundamental theorem of calculus and just take this current expression here and plug in T for the upper limit and my 0 superscript minus for the lower limit. Ah, and I need some more space. All right, so I'll scoosh this down. Scoosh this down. This slide kind of looks like a neon factory threw up. Anyway, <laughs> let's get to anyway, let's get back down to business here. All right. Let's imagine for a second that I take this term here with the minus sign, this constant of integration here, and I move it over to the left hand side. So I'm gonna do that, and I'm also going to swap the left and right sides of the equation. Okay, so doing all of that swapping around, I can write this as VCT is equal to one over C, the integral of IC, plus my pre-initial condition on the voltage. For the inductor, I'll have ILT on the left is equal to one over L, my integral of the voltage, and then plus my initial condition. Remember, I did two steps at once there. If it looks strange that I'm going from minus to plus and minus to plus, remember that I'm moving these terms over to the other side and then also swapping these sides of the expressions. All right, now here's the interesting part. You can get the expression down here by just taking the Laplace transform of both sides. Remember, integration in the time domain corresponds to dividing by s in the Laplace domain, just as differentiation in the time domain corresponded to multiplying by s in the Laplace domain. And when we think about taking the Laplace transform of these constants over here, remember we're doing one-sided, aka unilateral Laplace transforms, so we could just as easily imagine multiplying these constants by a unit step function and getting something equivalent, and that's what gives us the s's down here. So all of that was to say that there wasn't anything particularly special about starting with the derivative forms of the time domain expressions for capacitors and inductors and creating these forms first. I could have just as easily started with these fairly common integral forms of those fundamental time domain expressions for the behaviors of capacitors and inductors and derived these kinds of equivalent circuits first. And all of these expressions provide useful ways of thinking about the way capacitors and inductors operate in different domains. All right, so enough of all these equations. Let's do the thing I said I wanted to do earlier and scoosh the series form for the capacitor to join its parallel brethren and let the parallel form for the inductor join its series brethren and stare at this for a bit. So for each of these circuit elements, which form should you use, the series form or the parallel form? Well, it depends on the context. It depends on the particular circuit. It depends on the question that you need answered about that circuit. It may to some extent depend on what particular solution path to the circuit that you happen to see first. It may depend on which circuit techniques you are most comfortable using. There are a wide variety of techniques for tackling linear circuits, all sorts of tricks that you learn in a typical sophomore circuits class. There's delta Y transformations, there's source transformations, there's superposition, there's node voltage methods, there's mesh current methods. Your mileage may vary.
which model you should use may just depend on your mood that particular day. But it's nice that we have these options available. And all of those techniques that you learn for linear circuits apply to dealing with these circuits in the Laplace domain. I will say that the series form for the capacitor and the parallel form for the inductor feel more physically natural in the sense that if you look at the voltage source for the capacitor and if you look at the current source for the inductor, and if you think about what these would look like if you took their inverse Laplace transform, you'd wind up with the pre-initial condition on the voltage times ut, so that's just a unit step function. Or over here for the current source, well, what's the current in the current source? Well, it just turns on, and that one over s inverse transforms to a ut, so that feels, so that feels normal in some sense. Now, Let's think about the parallel form for the capacitor and the series form for the inductor. If I look at the current source and I were to inverse Laplace transform that, I would wind up with the capacitance times the pre-initial condition on the voltage. But what's the inverse Laplace transform of a constant? It's not a constant. It's a Dirac delta function. Well, that's weird. It's a current source that sort of creates this infinitely fast and kind of infinitely tall, but not really. We've talked about how thinking about a delta function as actually being infinite can potentially lead you to some odd and incorrect reasoning. But in any case, this is a freaky thing. Similarly, let's think about this voltage here. If I were to take the inverse Laplace transform of this expression, well, that's the inductance times the current pre-initial condition. And again, it's a constant. Inverse transforming it doesn't give you a constant. It gives you something that's very much not constant. It gives you a Dirac delta function. So here I have a voltage source. That's a Dirac delta function. It's sort of this infinitely fast blast of essentially infinite-ish voltage that if I were to integrate over it, gives you the appropriate amount here, or in the case of the capacitor, gives you the appropriate amount here, but you would have to integrate it for it to make sense. So these forms at the top, these do not feel physically plausible from an intuitive standpoint, but mathematically, they're equivalent to these forms down here. So there's something about this form for the capacitor of putting this voltage source in parallel that just turns on that is equivalent to this instantaneous current being blasted in the other direction. And for the inductor, it's very natural to think about this current source here that just turns on and then hangs out as a constant. And it somehow mathematically is equivalent to having the series voltage source going the other direction with this instantaneous blast of voltage. Think about that. Okay, so if you are not one of my 3084 students at Georgia Tech, you can tune out here. If you are, I would like to tell you what questions three and four on the quiz are. For question three, I want you to tell me what the least favorite class you've taken at Georgia Tech is. And for question four, I want you to tell me what was your least favorite thing about that class. Now, the reason I'm making this a quiz is the answers are just going to me, and I will keep that information to myself. And I won't distribute that information any further.